Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. So this talk is about load balancing. So the concept of this talk is we want to take you through sort of the last 10 years of load balancing. I kind of demonstrate how everything fits together from, you know, low level stuff like ECMP all the way up to, you know, things like service meshes. Um, you know, by the end of this talk, you should know your L4s from your L7s from your service meshes, when you can and can't use client load balancing, all these things. If this is stuff that's, that, you know, you already know, there is nothing revolutionary here. This is sort of a, you know, explaining the last 10 years kind of talk. So you have an award. Okay, so load balancing. So load balancing. Technology. <laughs> God damn it. All right, there we go. Okay, so this is me over here on the, on the left of this slide. Uh, so uh, I'm currently, actually don't have a job, so if anyone's hiring. Um, I was most recently at Google. I was an SRE for there for like five years. The last couple of years I spent working specifically on the edge network. Um, I also had some pre-Google experience in the so-called real world. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, true. Um, yeah, my name is Maruli Surya. I'm currently a storage SRE at Google. Uh, prior to that, I've done many, many networking things, which is why we've ended up doing um, this talk. All right, this one. Oh, Very cool. good. Okay, so, you know, why is it that we think that load balancing is important to talk about? And it's not just because we both had to spend way too much time thinking about it and caring about it. You know, load balancing is sort of, it's the, the, the skeleton and the flesh and bones of your, of your systems. It's what ties them all together, right? Um, load balancing failures are very often very visible to users. They're dropped requests. Um, they may be failures. Um, it's always in your serving path that's adding latency, perhaps. And it's got a huge impact on the performance and the resiliency of your application. If you're load balancing, your load balancing can really hurt that or can really help it. So uh, we're going to be using this really, really simplistic example throughout this talk as we sort of try and demonstrate how the systems hang together. So we start off with our user, and our user wants to um, access this, this uh, superbowls.com website, which is, you know, our, we're, we're a very small cloud vendor. This is the 1990s, like, you know, it's the early, the early start of all this stuff. And our, our customer is selling owl-related merchandise. So um, one of the things that I'm going to say about this talk is we're completely skating over every question about how do we horizontally scale our application? Because there's quite enough to be going on with already with just the load balancing aspects. So we're going to assume that this superbowls.com website is trivially horizontally scalable. And if you want to know more about that, I highly recommend Martin Kleppman's Designing Data Intensive Applications. Right. So here is our, our, our simplest possible um, architecture. In 1997, we might have done this before Slashdot was invented and screwed everything up for everyone, right? Um, so we've got a DNS record um, so mapping our URL, superbowls.com, to 203.0.1.1.3.20, which is the publicly addressable IP address of our one web server in the world. Um, we have an intranet uh, represented here by the IT crowd style intranet box with the blinky light. And, you know, somewhere we have a data center, we've got some, some routers that are advertising that a, a block of addresses containing that IP to the world. Okay, simple enough. Do we have any load balancing here? Eh, not really, no. Um, we have a couple of things that are kind of aspects of load balancing, though. So we do have some load distribution at the network level. So we saw that we've got multiple edge routers. There's going to be a great deal of redundancy in the actual internet paths, most likely, um, you know, between our user and ourselves. There's going to be more than one path, and you know, the, the magic of BGP and IP path selection is giving us some load distribution, potentially, across different paths. Different users are probably arriving by, by different network paths. And it's giving some high availability because all these protocols have um, ways of detecting and, and reacting to failures built in. So we have the sort of the, the germ of, of, of some, some load balancing concepts. But, but we, we still only have one web server. And if that goes down, whether planned or unplanned, we're down. And also, capacity. We only have one web server. And if we need to serve more KPS than it can handle, we're, we're, we're hosed as well. OK. OK. So yeah, as Laura mentioned, sorry, let me move this cursor. It's annoying me. Um, as Laura mentioned, at the moment, um, let's say our servers can each only serve five queries a second, right? So if we need more than five queries a second of capacity, we need to add a ser uh, another server. Uh, note, again, this is not a capacity planning talk. There are many capacity planning talks. Um, we're not going to talk about the details of that. Um, Implementation-wise, what, what do we change about our previous design? 
So we update DNS. So for, well, first we add a new server, right? We add this server ending .21. Um, it serves exactly the same content as .20. And then we uh, update our DNS configuration so that um, our DNS server will res return both IP addresses, right? Um, and there are a couple of different ways you could do this, right? Depending on how your DNS server works, you can configure it to return uh, one IP address, but round robin between the two. You can configure it to return both and rely on your clients to hopefully load balance approximately evenly between them. Um, there are lots of complexities in what the end result will be, but hopefully if you have enough requests coming in, you will end up with approximately a 50-50 split in terms of the amount of load each uh, of your two servers gets, um, gets sent. Um, so now what happens when one of our servers goes away, right? In the previous setup, if the server went away, the site was just down, right? Because you just had the one server. Um, in this setup, if one server goes away, and if we assume hand-waving that each server is getting about 50% of your load, um, if this server goes away and is hard down, about 50% of your client requests are just going to get timeouts, right? They're just going to go, eh, don't know what's going on. Um, probably someone tweets at you, um, if you're lucky and if you've been thoughtful, you have some monitoring. Um, and as a result of that, you're like, okay, I should probably change my DNS configuration. Let me go and, you know, update the bind zone file, SCP it somewhere, half a binary, blah, 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 like whatever tedious rubbish you need to do. And then once you've pushed that, after your DNS TTL has expired, so the TTL being how long is this DNS response valid for, once that has expired, hopefully most of your users um, will no longer see this problem, assuming that your single server has enough capacity to serve the remaining load. Um, a caveat here, some clients and some name servers may be smart enough to detect this failure, right? Maybe your, maybe your name server is checking your, your individual servers to see, hey, is this healthy? Uh, maybe your client is like, oh, I've got two IP addresses here. The one I picked isn't working. Let me try the other one. But you, unless you actually write control that code, you can't really rely upon it, right? Um, in all of these cases, even in the best case, you're adding latency to the perceived end user experience, right? It'll just be longer before they see the page load. Um, so talking a little bit about DNS TTL trade-offs, right? Um, so as we mentioned before, when you get a DNS response, um, it is valid for some lifetime, right? And that could be anywhere from like a year to a day, down to an hour, down to a minute. Um, and there are trade-offs with what's going on. If you have a long TTL, uh, say, say a day, then your users won't see any change you make for that period of time, right? So your ability to actually mitigate an outage is, is bounded, has a lower bound of what your DNS TTL is. But if you, conversely, if you try and put a very short TTL because you want to be able to react to failure more quickly, uh, you have a couple of downsides here, right? You have higher load on your DNS infrastructure because if you go from, say, a one-hour TTL to a five-minute TTL, you're going to basically get about 12x the amount of um, requests coming to your DNS server, right, on average. Um, your clients have to query DNS more often, so that adds latency to your, to your page load time um, rather than just getting a cache hit. Um, and also, your, the availability of your DNS server now is much more of an integral part of the availability of your overall system, right? Because rather than querying DNS once a day, your clients have to query it once every five minutes. Um, the other thing to note here, many DNS clients and many recursive name servers will ignore TTLs below a certain number, right? That might be one minute, that might be five minutes, but lots of things will go, ooh, you're handing me back a 10-second TTL, I'm just going to pin it for one minute because a 10-second TTL seems silly. So let's head back to our story. Um, what does DNS load balancing give us? It does give us load distribution, right? It allows us to spread load across multiple pieces of infrastructure. If you want to add a new server, you add a new A record in your DNS config, or quad A record if you're using IPv6. And, you know, so this is a strict improvement on not having multiple servers. Um, in terms of high availability, it's still not great because you've got this TTL problem, right? There's, an, there's a lower bound on how quickly you can respond to failure. Um, and in terms of flexibility, it's kind of annoying, right? Um, if you're just using bind or some simple DNS server that has a static configuration, you're going to need manual operator intervention when you want to scale up your serving capacity or when you want to take something that's broken out of service. Um, and this is fair enough, right? DNS was not designed as a load balancing solution. It was designed as, as a naming service. 
um, it, we, we added load balancing to it because it was kind of this universal entry point for how people access network services. Okay, so clearly DNS is not gonna give us everything that we might want for a really highly available service. So we, here's where we start seeing something that looks a bit more like a load balancer. So this uh, little sort of black thing with the arrows on it, this represents a load balancer. So we've only drawn one of them here, but this hopefully is some sort of actually a high, high availability cluster. It could be um, like hardware appliances. There are many vendors that sell these. Um, it could also be software, something like HA, a proxy, Nginx. There's many, many sort of variants on this. So what we've done here is we have created a virtual IP, which is owned by this load balancing cluster. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the networking tricks that go into this shortly. But um, this virtual IP isn't, doesn't belong to any one machine. Um, we've, um, our clients now, they, get, they hit DNS, they get the virtual IP, and they, they, uh, their packets go through the internet, hit our edge routers, and, and go to one of our cluster of, or our single, but don't do that, load balancer, which forwards the packets onto our backend um, servers. So these now don't actually need to be directly addressable from the internet anymore. So those of you who are uh, familiar with what internal IP addresses look like, we've moved these to 192 addresses. Um, 192.168. So there is a fundamental concept called five tuple hashing. Um, this sort of underpins network load balancing at so many, in so many places. So our layer four load balancer is balancing based only on the properties of the IP packet. So it's based on the source address port, destination address port, and protocol. And we'll forget about you know, layer three balancing where, uh, where we're doing non-IP uh, protocols, but you, know, you, you balance with what you have, right? So you take a hash of that five tuple, and based on that, you select a backend, and that could be you know, a simple modulo your number of backends, or you might be doing something a little bit more fancy, some sort of more consistent hashing. Um, Maglev paper by Google is a really good read if you're interested in that end of things. So this same scheme is used for your, la your layer four balancers, and it's also used to do a lot of the network layer load balancing. If you wanna balance packets across um, parallel fibers in a bundle that you've put together into one logical larger bundle, you use the same scheme. Um, if you want to balance across um, parallel um, IP networking paths, you also use this same scheme. This is used everywhere. Oh, okay. So back to our uh, back to our thing. So what we have is this: we have this fairly basic layer four balancer. Now it's taking the connections that come in and it's load balancing on a connection level. So the job of this layer four balancer is to be configured with some set of backends, so our 192.168.0.20 and 21. It knows that these exists, and as, uh, as packets come in, it, based on the properties of that packet, it, its job is to send all the packets in the same connection to the same backend. So we're not balancing requests here, we're balancing connections, and that has some implications. Um, it means that we're not balancing load or requests, we're just balancing connections. Um, still, this is a lot better than what we had before with DNS. We can, without any significant delay, we can remove either of these backends from serving, or if we have some more spare capacity without any significant delay, we can put new backends in serving. So this is much, much better. Also, the layer four balancers are directly communicating with the backends, so it's much easier to add health checking in here than it is with the DNS case, because DNS is not in any way directly talking to your backends. This is. Now we can see how we can do load distribution. We can, we can spread load across infrastructure, high availability. We can avoid using unhealthy infrastructure. And with layer four balancers, like we say, we can just notice, hey, this machine's not up or this port's not up. Don't send traffic there. You can build that right in. Um, no, no human has to be involved. But there's still some things that we can't do. So uh, we, we're not aware of load on servers, just literally connections. And um, One connection might be doing some hugely um, heavy database query and another connection is just doing a very very small query. Um, it's very hard to do sensible um, kind of load shedding. It's very hard to do sort of prioritization of, well, you can't do prioritization of requests. Um, you can't do things like balance based on cookies or anything like that. So we'll see more of that later. So um, this simple diagram that we're showing here, it's adding you know a huge amount of network detail. Again, this is not a network architectures talk, but 
over the last 10 years, um, the, the complexity and the redundancy that we tend to see in our data center networks has exploded. So we have cross networks. We just expect these to be much more reliable and much, much higher bandwidth. So we kind of expect there to be a lot of different network paths available between our, our end users and our servers. And we're going to talk a bit more in detail about how that balancing works. OK, so we're going to talk about network load balancing and also um, just kind of network packet flow as well, right? So um, if you can imagine a fairly typical data center setup is you might have every rack of machines has a switch at the top of the rack, right? And it has some number of servers plugged into it. Uh, when I say switch, because I'm like a, a grumpy old network engineer, I mean something that cares about Ethernet MAC addresses, right? This thing doesn't really care about IP addresses. Um, that top of rack switch probably uplinks to two routers, uh, routers caring about IP addresses. Um, and this whole one plus one redundancy model is fairly common in networking, right? Because for the longest time, you would buy big network appliances from network vendors because that's how they gave you more capacity. And because you had one big one of these, to add redundancy, you would buy a second one, and this was great for their business, right? Um, new network designs using like clause topologies tend to do more horizontal scale out, right? Four way, eight way, 16 way, but one plus one redundancy is still very, very common. Um, so if we consider traffic to and from this one server in one of these racks, um, in this case, you've got um, a machine has a network port, the network port connects to a switch. So each of those is a single point of failure, right? Maybe you have, like some people have servers with multiple NICs, that's a whole other talk. Um, but it does have two possible routers, right? It has two possible ways to get to the rest of the world. In this setup, the inbound traffic and the outbound traffic is going in and out on that left-hand rail. Um, probably there's some sort of protocol, um, and there are many standard protocols for this, VRRP is, is one thing, where the two routers uh, at the top level act as one virtual router, right? That's the name of the protocol, virtual router redundancy protocol. Basically, all that happens is they health check each other and decide between them who is like the primary and who will handle all the traffic from the server. Um, in terms of traffic from the internet to those routers, that relies on basically IP multipath, right? The network says, I have many different paths to this destination. They're of the same cost. And so I'll use the same five tuple hashing that Laura mentioned earlier to pick one of those two paths for any given, any given flow or packet. Um, when one of these links goes away, when a link goes away or the router goes away, then the network reconverges basically transparently under the application, right? Um, you might, if you're very, very sensitive, right, if you're running some real-time media application or, or something, you might notice. But if you're running on top of TCP, probably you won't even notice at all, right? From a user experience point of view, this will just transparently fail over. Um, so now, if we talk about multiple racks for the machines, Okay, so that was the, the availability story, but we also want to be able to use more capacity in our network. So how do we make use of all the bandwidth that's available with all these multiple network paths that we have? So um, we have something that looks like this. Um, and I explained the five tuple hashing before, and it's basically the same thing. Where we have multiple paths available um, at each kind of decision point, each each box or, or each switch or router on this, on this diagram, it will evaluate what are the paths that are available, and it will use that five-tuple hashing scheme to choose a path through the network. So we see here um, the, the, bl the blue connection we have uh, coming in through one, one router and going out the other, and, and, and vice versa with this. One quite important thing here is to notice is in your network, you're very un that, that's using a scheme like this, you're very unlikely to see packets taking the, both the same route inbound and outbound. Um, and that's something that really confuses people um, when they start kind of doing trace routes and pings because you're, you're really only seeing kind of one part of that journey. Um, and and it, can, it can be very misleading. Another really interesting thing here is um, this sort of, to get full use out of the capacity of your network, it, you're doing probabilistic balancing here. So you're kind of making an assumption that if I balance each flow, I'm balancing the use of bandwidth. However, um, in the real world, um, people then write applications that do things like try to copy all the contents of a virtual machine across a single TCP connection as fast as possible. And this leads to a thing called elephant flows. So an elephant flow is when you've got one single TCP flow that's carrying um, high bandwidth. Uh, the reason that that's problematic is um, we're, we're hashing based on our five tuple. That whole flow has the same five tuple, so it's all going to take the same path. Um, what that means is, even though you've got plenty of bandwidth in aggregate on your network, 
you're, you're, you're hot spotting on one physical link or a bundle. Uh, actually, well, it will be one physical link even if you're using a logical bundle. And, uh, and that means that you've got net packets dropping in part of your network while most of it is fine. So as application developers and as administrators, that's a really important thing to think about. The VPN tunnels are another place where you can end up with these elephant flows. So uh, what happens if we get a failure? Um, so a hard, a hard failure is easy. If, if, a, if a link is completely down, that tends to be quite easy to spot and quite easy to find and fix. Um, problems tend to arise where we have a link that is sort of sporadically misbehaving, so it's uh, dropping some, some percentage of, of packets. So what you can end up then is you end up, you know that something is flaky in your network somewhere and you're sort of seeing it on the occasional flow here and there, but if it's somewhere in the middle of, of your network, rather than being the connection to a specific host, um, to a top of rack switch, it can be really hard to find this. So you can either spend hours you know, running TCP dump um, and pinging it, or you can start building fancy tools to, to find these sorts of things. So net NORAD is the thing that Facebook wrote that's designed to find these sort of, um, you know, slightly unhealthy link is causing, un is causing widespread slight sadness. So uh, hardware is, it was, it's, it's not to be trusted to, to diagnose these kinds of faults. You need, you need really rigorous probing that kind of understands the, the five tuple addressing scheme and, and can narrow this stuff down. Okay. So we've talked about multipathing and load distribution. So back to network load balancing. So this is the last diagram that we saw before. So we've got our network load balancer, our VIP, the 200 and our two backends. So again, we're hiding some detail. So this is a, a transparent proxy architecture. And, and again, we're, we're proxying packets to and also from the backends. So we're just, each time a packet comes in, we're gonna, gonna rewrite the header, send it off to, uh, to a server, and then when we get the reply packet back, we'll remember where we had to send it. So we're doing network address translation in that. Um, loads of state in the load balancer it has to know uh, about all the, the ongoing connections so it, it, it can do that mapping. And that works really well until it doesn't. You know, you don't want to have to start worrying about all the problems of synchronizing state. Um, so uh, another thing as well is your backends are not going to see the uh, IP information of the original requests. Does that matter? We shall see. And also, you know, we have, we have an extra hop, an, an extra trip through the, the load balancer both on the way in and the way out. That adds a bit of latency. Yeah, so one thing that's become fairly common, uh, particularly for, I guess, web services, right, is web services tend to be very asymmetric in terms of bandwidth, right? The amount of, you have typically very small requests coming into your, to your service, and you have large responses going out. Um, if you're in this previous setup, what this means is you need to size your load balancer to be able to take the bandwidth of all the response traffic, right? And if you have like 10 times as much response bandwidth as request bandwidth, that's actually really, really inefficient. So a common trick that a lot of people do is they do this thing called DSR, which is direct service or direct server return, uh, which is basically you do some magic which allows your incoming path to go through your load balancer, but then you have your return traffic go directly back to the user. Um, there are a couple of ways to do this mechanically, uh, but it gives you a, a bunch of advantages. Um, one of the big things this allows you to do is it allows you to preserve the original IP address information um, in the packet that gets to your backend. Um, this is super useful for anything that has kind of a reputational or like metadata component, right? So spam and abuse use IP blacklists all the time, right? Like, is this mail server trustworthy? Um, IP geolocation, like, do I want to serve different content to people based on where in the world I think they are? I mean, there are problems with this, which we'll talk about, but this does give you more information. Um, so there are two main implementations. Um, the first one, which was the one that was used for a long time, uh, is less used now, is something called Layer 2 DSR. This basically relies on having your load balancer and all of the backends for a given VIP in the same um, Layer 2 domain, right? Which basically means plugged into the same Ethernet switch, into the same VLAN, um, which practically for most people means plugged into the same rack. And so what that means is there's an upper bound on the number of backends you can have for a given load balancer, which is the number of machines in your rack, right? Um, so, you, so you still have your service VIP that's .200, and then in this case, you have two backends or N backends, which are on the same subnet as that VIP, or there are, there are details I'm going to gloss over. I'm not going to go into the detail here because it's not what most people, I suspect, will run into. Um, it's the same, same failure domain. Yeah, and you still have the same failure domain here, right? You still have your rack and, as, as, your, as your single failure domain. Uh, although maybe there are people here who've run like massive extended layer twos across buildings. Um, I'm sorry. Good luck. 
Yeah. <laughs> so what's layer three DSR? This is the, this is the more common thing today. Um, what it does is it basically allows you to do the same thing of preserving the original source IP address from your users. Um, and it allows this thing, this asymmetric traffic flow inbound through the load balancer and outbound directly. But your backends can basically be anywhere that you have IP reachability to. And so that gives you much more scaling and it, and just IP is fundamentally better than layer two, right? Sorry, I have my own biases. Um, so how does this work? Your incoming flow, as this is your black line going from the internet to your load balancer. Um, the source IP is the user's public IP and the dest IP address is your VIP and that's fine. Um, your load balancer makes a load balancing decision, right? It does the five tuple hash and this is fine. And then it picks, okay, I'm gonna send this to 2.20, great. What it does then is it sticks another IP header on the front of the existing packet, right? And so you have your original packet at the bottom there, right? The, the last two white bullets are the original two from the previous slide. There's this little end cap shim header, and then there's another IP header on the outside where the destination IP is the IP address of, of one of your backends. Um, so the request IP header is preserved. The traffic goes on to your, to your load balancer, sorry, from your load balancer to your backend. Um, the key point here is the backends need to be able to decapsulate this, this packet. Um, two common protocols that are used for this are GRE or IP and IP. These are both supported in the Linux kernel and you can also do user space implementations. Um, but what your serving binary gets when, when that packet is decapsulated is it gets the original IP packet. Um, so there is slightly more complexity in terms of configuration on your backends compared to the strict, just normal proxy case because they need to know about accepting connections from the VIP. The other thing here is you need to be careful about your MTU, MTU being the maximum transition unit through your network. Uh, 1500 bytes is a fairly common MTU. So if you have a 1500 byte packet coming into your load balancer and then it adds 40 bytes of additional IP header, then your network devices might drop those um, packets. And so you've just got to keep that in mind when you're thinking about this. For most people, it maybe won't matter because requests tend to be small, but think about it, right? And there are, there are mechanisms for clamping on this. Um, and then your return packet, it just goes back. It's just a normal IP packet. There's no encapsulation. There's no nothing. It goes straight back out to the internet. And there's no bandwidth constraint of however big the load balancer is. OK. So. OK, so, you know, Harry Potter comes out. Owls hit the big time. Everybody wants owls and owl-related products. So, um, you know, suddenly our business, um, they, they, they want more availability and more reliability than we can get from just one single user. So we got to go multi-region. So advantages of going multi-region means that you can serve from closer to your users potentially, and you've got much better reliability. You don't have to worry about a single building outage anymore. I mean, data centers do go on fire, um, hurricanes happen. We've all, I don't know if we've all seen this, but we've seen this. Um, so how do we do it? So we, we okay, so we, we'll, do, we'll do this the simple thing first, right? So we'll take the same virtual IP address, so our 203.0.113.200, and we will have that um, we will have that served by two different uh, load balancer clusters in our two regions. We've got two different. Uh, we cloned the whole thing. We got two sets of backends. Uh, we got two sets of load balancers. We got two sets of edge routers. We got internet connections. Um, our DNS is, is still pointing at that one virtual IP. So how? How do we balance um, between the two regions, right? So this is done using um, a networking trick called Anycast. Um, so that just means that we advertise the same address space from both locations and how packets will get from the user to either one of your regions is mostly dependent on the perceived cost of those paths from the perspective of your ISP. Now, um, without going too much into BGP details, there are all, it's designed for network operators to be able to configure how the traffic flows through their network to the networks that they peer with. Um, mostly they do this based on how cheap is it for me to put bits on this pipe versus that pipe. But by and large, it mostly has the effect of routing people to places that are geographically closer and lower latency. So what we should just say is uh, Anycast is not load balancing, and Morali actually gave a whole talk on this last year, which is a good talk. Sadly, there's no video of it, so you should give it again some other time. That's my fault. Um, it's really hard to monitor. So if you're probing your site that's um, run using Anycast, you know that at least one is up if your probes are returning good, but you don't know how many of them are up. That, that's not great. 
um, the really big downside of Anycast from an operator point of view, if you're running a high traffic service, is you have zero control. A site is either on and willing to accept all the traffic that comes at it, or it's off. And that's, uh, that's not a great story if you want to be able to kind of have control over where traffic is flowing. Uh, having the same address everywhere, it's an invitation to cascading failure. Because what that means is if you have a sudden a, a global um, traffic spike, uh, what it may do is it may take down um, one, one network location that happens to be closest to, or one region that's closest to wherever it is generating the traffic spike, that goes down splat, and then the traffic just flows to the next place and the next place, taking down all of your regions like dominoes. You don't want that. It's also not great for anywhere where you have a, a long-running connection from your client to your server. Um, there's a thing called like intranet weather, which you know, on, on the internet, links are constantly going up, going down. ISPs are changing their configs because they made a new deal with a new peer. Um, th like preferences for where where routes should go just kind of shift around, and that happens often enough that if you're doing long-running connections and your two regions are not too far apart, um, you know, users may actually see their connections resetting. So, so new plan, uh, we don't do any cast anymore. We give each region its own VIP, and we, we go back to our DNS load balancing. We put those two distinct VIPs. Into our, into our DNS, and we let DNS round robin between them. So this is good, so now we have the ability to, um, to turn off one of our regions if we want to. If you've got weighted, um, weighted round robin, we can, just, we can decide roughly how much load we would like to go to each site. But we have all those problems with DNS load balancing that we had before in terms of there's a big delay if we want to turn off one of these sites based on the DNS TTL. Okay. So the normal solution to this problem is this. You, you still have two VIPs, and you advertise them in both locations, and you advertise them both in BGP. But, and there's a few ways of doing this, which we don't have enough time to go into, but you use a trick of some sort, probably you know, more or less specific routes or something of that nature, to make each site um, either primary or secondary for the VIPs. So each site is primary for a particular VIP, so if it is up and serving, traffic directed there will go there preferentially. But if it goes away, whether suddenly or, 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 or in a planned way, um, the, other, the other site can just seamlessly take over receiving that traffic or the other sites. So um, this concept is called cover routes. So we got control. Uh, we have automatic failover in an emergency. It probably takes a few seconds because you know BGP takes a little while to con converge, um, but you will get it within faster than a human can react. Um, but there's a problem, right? Um, we, we, we still need to get users to the closest site. Let's say we have um, you know two, uh, a West Coast and an East Coast site. We do not want to be sending our users in New York. Um, all the way over to the West Coast. We're adding like 100 milliseconds or so of completely unnecessary latency. And if you're selling stuff, latency is money, unfortunately. So we use um, GNS, DNS geolocation. So we look at where the request appears to be coming from, from the user. And we use a big map of, uh, that tries to map IP addresses to a geographical region to choose which of the regions is likely to be closest to that user, or which of the healthy serving regions. And this sort of works, but then there are some problems with it. So. Yeah, so DNS, load, DNS geo load balancing specifically, as with everything in this talk, there are always caveats. Um, the big problem here is that um, the, it's, it's complex and error prone, right? Internet addressing uh, wasn't really designed to be used like this. Um, particularly IPv4, there are lots of kind of holes in the address space where address space has kind of moved around as people have bought and sold address space. Um, the other thing is that the way that DNS works is that typically your authoritative name server, so the thing that's making the, the balancing decision for superbowls.com, typically doesn't get the packet, for, the DNS request packet from the end user device, right? It's not going to get it from my phone. It's going to get it from the DNS server of my ISP most of the time. And let's say I, my ISP is Comcast. Um, maybe Comcast have one DNS server for all of their U.S. customers, right? I don't know, but this is this is not a, this is not implausible, right? This is a thing that has happened to various ISPs, and so your ability to make mapping decisions based on that is actually fairly coarse. Um, 
So you can either take the hit on this, right? You can say, well, it'll probably be okay, but there'll be some suboptimal ma mapping. Or if your business people are like, no, this is terrible. This customer on the West Coast cannot be mapped to New York. This is ridiculous. You're like, okay, what's their IP address? Let me put an override in my DNS load balancing config. And, you know, 10 years later, you have like a 500 meg file of, of overrides, right? It's, it's awful. Um, there are ways around this. Um, there is a DNS extension. Uh, EDNS0 is a, is, a protocol, is a kind of format for adding extensions to DNS responses. Uh, client subnet is the name of a particular extension where recursive DNS servers include some number of the bits of the original client IP address. For IPv4, it tends to be 24 bits. For IPv6, I want to say it's 48. Um, but what this does is it gives the authoritative name servers a little bit more information about where the request is coming from at the cost of um, slightly decreased cacheability, right? Because now a name is not the only thing, is not the only cache key. It's the name and the requesting subnet. And so this is implemented by a bunch of people, uh, and I need to move on because we're running out of time. Um, Back to our story. Okay, so we haven't seen how to be load aware. All we're doing is spraying connections, and like we say, a, 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 an IP connection is not anything really related to how much load is generating. We don't know how to do content-based balancing based on a URL, based on a cookie, based on um, who the user is, anything like that. We don't know how to do any policy enforcement. We don't know how, what, where is a good place to do load shedding or, uh, or rate limiting, anything like that. So this is where layer seven load balancing comes in. Yeah. Um, so layer 7 load balancing, this is application load balancing, right? This is a load balancer that is aware of your application protocol. Previously, the load balancer only knew about IP addresses and port numbers, maybe. Uh, in this setup, it knows about whatever your application protocol is, be that DNS, be that HTTP, be that, you know, quick, whatever. Um, it terminates the, the network connection from the user and possibly even the application connection from the user, right? So in an HTTP setup, this would be a reverse proxy like Nginx. It actually terminates your SSL session. It looks at what uh, host and URL and other query params you're sending and then makes intelligent decisions on how to route that request based on application information. Um, and also the key point here is it does actually can, it can actually balance application requests, not just network connections. Because for example, in HTTP, you can have many requests coming in over the same HTTP connection and maybe you want to balance them differently. So the physical setup here, um, if you change the diagram, like this is the same diagram we had before, but you can imagine that this black box in the middle is now a layer seven balancer instead, like Nginx or Envoy or, or whatever. Um, what happens here is you now can make decisions on host name and URL and so on. Um, another thing to bear in mind, all of the things we've talked about so far, they will end up being composed together, right? So in this setup, we have your DNS server, you have your user, your user's traffic hits a layer four balancer, right? So this is the thing that's just looking at IP traffic. That layer four balancer probably um, spread stuff out above, uh, across multiple um, layer seven Nginx instances, which themselves each have some number of Tomcat backends or whatever, which can actually serve responses to the request. Um, and this is fundamentally how lots of large web content providers um, do this. And we have a bunch of links in a slide at the end where you can go and read some examples, articles, and, and papers on how people do this. Uh, this is still me. Um, the big thing with layer seven load balancing is there are a lot more uh, scalability concerns. Um, your layer seven balancing needs a lot more resource to do each, to handle each request, right? It needs some amount of memory um, and some amount of CPU time to handle each of those requests. Um, also, because it's stateful, one of these things crashing will be visible to your users, right? Um, unless you have a thick client, which papers over this, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but it has some upsides, right? A layer seven balancer can retry requests, right? So if you hit an Nginx instance and it tries a backend and that backend goes away, then it's like, oh, well, I still know what this request was. Let me try another backend without bothering the client. Um, so you can hide some of those failures. Um, layer seven balancers can be load aware um, and they can also do things like per user rate limits, uh, rate limits per host name or per URL, right? Maybe you don't care about serving certain classes of your website, right? Or maybe you want to, you don't care about serving Googlebot compared to serving actual user requests. And these are the sorts of things that you can put in this kind of load balancer. All right, um, I'm going to skip over the cloud slide because we don't have time. Uh, let's talk about algorithms. Yep. Okay, so we talked about round robin. Round robin is literally, you know, I give you one, I give you one, I give you one. Um, yeah, like, 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 yeah. 
cards. Yeah, like cards. I know I've got six minutes, yes. So round robin is, um, it, can, it can lead to pretty uneven balancing because it's, it's not really aware of how much, how much load is on in each request. Um, so it, 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 it's, not, it's not the best. Also, not all backends are created equal. Sometimes a backend is running on a slower machine or a machine that's very heavily loaded with some, some other thing, right? So sometimes you want to, st we, it's, very uh, it's very tempting to say, okay, we'll, we'll send all the load to the least loaded backend. Uh, problem is you've got multiple load balancers. They all notice that a, a newly started uh, server has less load and then they all hammer it. So be very careful with that. Uh, weighted round robin, you can try and guess which, which services are, which instances of your service are performing better and send a bit more load to them. So it's, it's not as drastic as the least loaded. Um, probation is where you, you notice that things are new to your pools and you ramp up the load slowly. That's a really good thing to do. Choice of two is ab about making the, this efficient, this, an efficient computation on your load balancer. So like keeping these sort of ranked lists of how, how loaded things are is, is pretty, pretty intensive. So you pick two and you compare them and say, okay, this one's serving less errors. So client load balancing. We've seen how to do like load balancing with, with a proxy in between the user and, and the backends. Uh, not all load balancing is done this way. You can actually do client load balancing. So clients on the left, servers on the right, backends. You've got some sort of registry that will tell the clients what are the list of servers. And then you actually have the clients do the load balancing logic instead of having, having a specific service to do that. And then the servers can, can convey load reports back to the clients. This is good because you don't have to run an expensive set of load balancers. There's no extra latency, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of upsides. There are some cons. If you don't if if you don't trust your clients, it's very easy for malicious or just clients with bugs to to laser on one of your backends and take it down. So that's not great. So you need to trust your clients. Um, and the other thing as well is this is a fat client. You know this is. This is something that you need to have control over the, the actual application code. If you're in an organization and you're run, using multiple programming languages, as many of us are, you need a fat client per, per programming language, and that's, that's terrible. So architecturally, it looks like this. So in this, in this case, um, the clients are our web service front ends, and they're talking to some other back end microservice. So. Yeah. Um, so there are like client load balancing is very very powerful, but this this restriction of having to uh, trust your clients it makes it not appropriate for some uses, right? Um, a way you can get around this is you can put a uh, not quite a proxy, but just a shim layer in place, right? So what you can do is you can still do the load balancing on the client, as in they pick which backend to talk to, but you get your load reports from your servers, right? Because your servers you control and so you can trust. And this gives you the ability to kind of combine these two things. Um, this is very, very common inside um, storage systems. So if you read Google's like GFS or Bigtable papers, you will see this is a very common thing, right? Clients talk to a central thing that is trusted that knows where all the data is, and then the clients themselves pick which instance of the data they access. Um, service mesh. So service meshes are like the new hotness. They've sort of really just sort of started coming out in the last year or two. So we've seen proxy and client load balancing. Um, they're both... Uh, you, um, they're both intended and able to be used for balancing internet to service traffic and service to service traffic, and both uses are common. Service meshes are designed for sort of managing your microservices and the communications between them. Um, examples are Istio and Linkerd. Um, they're the descendants of things that were used in um, Google, so namely Stubby and Finagle at Twitter and Hystrix and Netflix. Um, these were originally those, those fat client systems that we saw. But we, we talked about the downsides of those. So there's a solution, and that is to, instead of having a fat client, which has to be programming language specific, you run this sidecar process alongside all the processes in your service. The sidecar talks to the control plane to get information about load and configuration. And then the service communicates with other, other services through the sidecar. So it's like an overlay network. And you can do all sorts of smart things here. You can, like... You can not only do all sorts of monitoring and all sorts of like rate limiting and load shedding, you can also use this as a, as a point to put in delays and failures for your chaos engineering. You know, these are really smart. They give you a lot of control and visibility into your systems. And architecturally, again, it looks a lot like the client's case. Okay, so. so yeah, the, the big idea with this stuff is consistency. Um, the whole point is with service mesh is you don't need to teach all of your client languages about how to do load balancing. You have a process that takes care of that for you and the normal binaries just talk over a socket and this is great. Um, the takeaways from here, 
Um, what do you want from your systems is what you need to think about. More capacity or higher availability or utilization. Uh, how fine growing control do you need? Um, and maybe you want more instrumentation and, instrumentation and monitoring, or maybe that's not so important to you. Uh, also, what constraints do you have, right? How, how much control do you have over your clients? How much control do you, over, do you have over your software stack? Uh, all of these things will influence what you're able to do. So yeah, yeah. just about on time. Indeed. I will add as well, uh, you know, most of these solutions at scale are going to involve layering a lot of the things that we've seen together. And as application developers, you know, and as you know, application people and administrators, remember the sort of the, 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 the warnings about elephant flows and MTUs. These are the things that will bite you. So thank you.